This meeting is now being recorded. Hi, welcome to the Lunch and Learn webinar. We're going to talk with Michelle Jeske. She's going to share with us first steps to running. She's a physical therapist from Westfield's Hospital and Clinic. And first of all, let me uh, let you know that we are recording the webinar. If you have to get off early, that's okay. I will send you the link to the webinar later during the week. And second, if you have a question for Michelle, there is a Q&A tab at the top of your screen. And you click on that and you can type in your questions. And Michelle will address those at the end of the webinar, end of her presentation. So um, that's all the the housekeeping to do, and I will turn this over to Michelle. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Donna mentioned, my name is Michelle Jeske, and I am a physical therapist at Westfields Hospital and Clinics. Um, I am so very happy that all of you have chosen to, to tune in to this webinar over your lunch period, uh, not only because I am passionate about the topic, but that your interest in running is important enough to you to dedicate part of your day to further expand your knowledge. So. Kudos to all of you for, for taking the time to listen to me. Here are the objectives that I um, set forth for this presentation. Um, I'm going to discuss some proper, the proper running form, and I use the term proper very loosely because what um, works well for one person does not always trans transfer over into working well for another person because we all come with our own individual um, anatomical variances and different strengths and weaknesses. So. There is a kind of a general guideline for proper running form, and I will be addressing that within this presentation. Another objective is going to be discussing some com common causes of running injuries. And then lastly, I will be providing you with some tips um, to minimize your risk of injury while you are starting a running program. All right, before we dive into the, um, the main topic of the presentation, I wanted to go through a little bit of the evolution of running, not only developmentally, but how running has evolved throughout history. Running is something that as a child, it, is, it comes naturally to us during development through play and curiosity. Running is a combination of both automa automatic and volitional movements, meaning that initiating running is something that we're usually driven by an external factor, such as seeing something that you want to explore further, but then the act of running itself is then further sustained by automatic movements that are generated within our central nervous system. The automatic movements then persist until the termination of movement is then decided, meaning that you have reached your desired goal at the end of that, at, that initiated the initial movement. Running is an integral part of development and play throughout a child's lifespan, but unfortunately as we transition into adults and even adolescents, most of us do not continue to use run as play. One of the first indications in history of humans using running for something other than play was the practice of persistence hunting. Bone structures of um, Homo erectus from over 2 million years ago demonstrated evidence that their diet contained high levels of protein, meaning that they were ingesting um, increased animals into their diet. The interesting part of this was that while that was occurring, um, this was at a time period over 50,000 years before fossils of arrows and other weapons were discovered. This is where the theory of persistence hunting was first developed. Persistence hunting develops tracking an animal over long distances and running it to exha into exhaustion. Ancient man ran hundreds of miles tracking and hunting for food, and its ability to outrun its prey was largely due to the fact that as humans, we possess the ability to sweat, and as a result, regulate our body temperature greater than the large prey. As a result, the humans that were able to survive and further reproduce were the ones that were most successful at outrunning their prey. This is where it is first believed that the human species began to evolve as endurance runners as it was necessary in order to hunt and to survive. Fast forward to 776 BC when the first organized running event was recorded in history during the first Olympic Games in Greece. These games were first started to honor Zeus and other gods, and the first race was simply a sprint from one end of the stadium to the other. Now on to a little bit more recent time. 
In the 16th century, running was first discovered to be used as a training method for, for swordsmen and then later was developed into common practice in the United States with the rise in popularity of professional sports. Running as a recreational sport has only been in the practice since the 1960s. Arthur Liddard of New Zealand is one of the most recognized athletic coaches of all time and is credited with popularizing the sport of running and making it commonplace across the sporting world. In 1961, Arthur Liddard formed the Auckland Joggers Club for social and fitness running. Keep in mind that to the general public, running at this time was viewed as a very risky activity for the average person due to the high cardiovascular demands placed on the body. In 1962, American long distance running coach Bill Bowerman visited Lydiard in New Zealand and was immediately taken aback by his inability to keep up with the members of the jogger, jogging club, some of whom were over 20 years his senior. Bowerman then returned to the United States and later went on to publish the very successful book Jogging in 1966 and so begun the running phenomenon. The Boston Marathon is one of the world's oldest annual marathons and ranks as one of the world's best known road racing events. With the transition from running being reserved for the professional athletes to the initiation of weekend warriors, you can see how this impacted the number of participants in the annual event, with the very first Boston Marathon having 18 entrants and the most recent year's um, marathon including almost 27,000 people finishing the race. This past Boston Marathon also provided us with a good reminder of the evolution of women within the sport of running. Featured in the two images on the right is Katherine Switzer, who was the very first woman to run the Boston Marathon as a numbered entry. The picture above is the iconic image of a male attempting to remove her bib, essentially to disqualify her from the race in 1967. This past Boston Marathon, Katherine was able to complete the same race 50 years later. So why start running? Unfortunately, while this cartoon is humorous, it does, in fact, depict one of the greatest myths regarding the practice of running, that it's bad for your knees. Recent studies, however, have shown that runners are no more likely than non-runners to develop osteoarthritis of the knee. Understanding and maintaining proper form can help reduce the risk of developing knee pain with running, which is one of the things that we're going to address in this webinar. So another reason why start running? There Running becomes with many of the health benefits as seen below in this slide. Um, it improves cardiovascular health. It can aid in weight loss. It has been known to um, increase longevity of life. It improves bone mineral density. It comes with many mental benefits in the form of stress relief. And also there's the social aspect of it. In pretty much any of the larger communities, there is always a running club that you're able to join. And it can be a wonderful way to meet new people when you move to a new area. Unfortunately, with running does come injuries. And although running is considered to be one of the most efficient ways to achieve improved fitness levels, the biggest issue with running is the high rate of injury. Generally accepted numbers of injuries suggest that approximately 50% of runners will experience an injury yearly, and 25% of runners are injured at any given time. There are certain criteria that predispose certain runners to injury more than others. Um, this criteria includes high mileage running, which would be greater than 40 miles per week, any previous running injury in the past 12 months, and then also there can be certain anatomical or body structural factors that can predispose you to, to injury, those including a rigid or a high arch in your foot, any sort of leg length discrepancy, and then overall muscle weakness or asymmetrical strength within side to side on your body. Running injuries are multifactorial in nature, nature meaning that they are the result of multi multiple different elements and systems at play. Um, seen below are the different components of, of running injuries. Biomechanical is described as the forces exerted by muscles and gravity on the skeletal structure. Musculoskeletal is defined as the system of muscles and tendons, ligaments, bones, and joints, and it is associated with the tissues that move the body and to maintain its form. 
So that's another system that can contribute um, if you have any sort of um, weaknesses or discrepancies within your musculoskeletal system that can contribute to injury. And then lastly, the mo and the most easily prevented yet is um, training errors contributing to running injuries. This graph to the right depicts um, some of the, the more prevalent injuries seen with running with predominantly knee injuries being the leading cause of pain. Um, and lower leg is also right behind there with almost a quarter. And then, as you can see, hip, pelvis, thigh, and back. So it's very much, you know, from the waist down injuries. And then the terms on the left side are just come the more medical, medically diagnosed names of the running injuries, which some of you may have heard of or may experience yourself. Now, some of you may be asking or have asked yourself, you know, what is the big deal with running? If I'm able to walk, I should have the necessary tools and strength to be able to run without difficulty or injury. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Now we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into the world of running biomechanics. Now I wish that running, that correcting running form was as easy as pretending that you were running by a bunch of ladies that you were trying to impress and just maintaining that all throughout your run. But unfortunately that's not the case. The truth is that running long distances requires you to be able to, to generate force and strength over long periods of time and at the same time not fatiguing as you are generating that force and strength. A biomechanical analysis of running form is a useful component of a physical therapy evaluation, not only for an injured runner, but also for the screening of a runner who is interested in um, injury prevention. The physical therapist would use special software and a camera with a high frame rate to analyze you at your running at your naturally preferred running pattern and speed. A uh, the therapist will record this from varying views and angles and then we'll use this information to provide you with advice on modifications of your current running form and also any sort of um, strength or flexibility concerns that they find. Before we get into a little bit more of descriptions of biomechanics of running, I just wanted to go through a couple of key terms which you may hear discussed within them. Uh, the first one, ground reaction force. This is the force that is exerted by the ground on a body in contact with it. So it's essentially the force that the ground is transmitting up through your body, not the force that you are putting down through it. Um, stance phase is the period of time where your leg is in contact with the ground. And then on the other end of the spectrum is swing phase of running, which is the period of time where the leg is not in contact with the ground. Single limb support is the period of time where your body is only supported by one of your legs at a time. Um, you also may re hear this referred to as single leg stance. And then, uh, Last term that is not um, included on the slide, but you also may hear discussed is the center of mass, which just means the middle or the average point of your body mass. The image here um, depicts the gait cycle. And the gait cycle for running, it begins when one foot be comes in contact with the ground and ends when the same foot comes in contact with the ground once again. When you are walking, there are two periods of double support, so meaning there are two periods of time where both feet are simultaneously in contact with the ground and able to support your body. With walking, stance phase is greater than 50% of the cycle. So you're thinking about the amount of time that your body is being supported by um, either one leg or both legs. With running, however, periods of double support give way to periods of double float, meaning that neither foot is touching the ground. Um, with the running cycle, you We'll hear a lot of um, talk about different phases. Um, some of them, some of the big ones being toe off, which is the initiation of your swing phase. This occurs before 50% of the gait cycle is complete. And then as you increase speed, you will find that this toe off or the initiation of swing phase occurs even quicker, which means that you have less time in that stance phase or that single leg support. During the running gait cycle, you also have periods of acceleration and deceleration which results in greater forces being distributed between ground and body. So those are just some of the reasons why it requires a lot more strength and a lot more um, consideration of your biomechanics when you are transitioning from walking to running. 
So looking at some of the different views and angles and um, parts of the gait cycle that physical therapists are concerned with, one of the first, one, first ones is the foot strike. So foot strike is defined as the part of your foot that makes contact with the ground at initial contact of stance phase. So the pictures here are listed in order with picture A being somebody who is more of the forefoot or the front of their foot striker. Picture B is a midfoot, so they tend to land with the middle of their foot making contact with the ground first. And then the last one would be your rear foot strikers, or the ones that tend to land on their heel first. There's limited evidence that supports that any one pattern of foot strike is more or less likely to cause injury. However, there has been a general consensus that runners with a rear foot strike pattern are more likely to de develop repetitive overuse injuries. Another important part to look at from the side view is your foot angle at heel strike. So this is for the, those runners that do have that heel strike pattern. Um, picture A has a relatively high foot inclination angle, and picture B has a relatively low inclination angle at heel strike. So you're asking yourself, why does this matter? A high heel strike, such as the one seen in picture A, is associated with a high ground reaction force being transmitted from the ground up throughout the lower chain. So in order to be efficient with running, the aim is to be exerting greater force on the running surface than the running surface is exerting on you. So with an increased ground reaction force at heel strike, you are, it is associated with um, greater braking impulses with running, causing you to lose momentum and higher peak vertical forces throughout your leg. So when you think about anything that causes you to lose momentum, you then have to work harder and your efficiency for that run is down and requires you to um, expend more energy to run the same distance as somebody who maybe doesn't have as high of a high angle at heel strike. Another um, aspect that we look at with running form is the hip extension angle, angle during your late stance phase. So reduced hip extension in late stance phase is a common observation seen with runners. And this would be more of the picture B, so they have a smaller hip extension angle. It is traditionally believed to be either due to tight hip flexors, weak hip extensors, so the muscles that help to extend that hip backwards, or a combination of the two. A good rule or goal is for approximately 10 degrees of hip extension to be occurring, but this can vary from each individual. Too small of hip extension angle can lead to too small of strides and an increased cadence or step rate. So with an increased hip angle, you then might find resulting increased low back extension, which can cause some lumbar, lumbar pain you might see that they are bounding more, which means that they are running more up and down than forward. You might see increased cadence, so that increased step rate. Or you also can see some overstriding, so they are taking too large of steps. With the biomechanical analysis, we also take a look at the overall, overall relation of your trunk to your hips during mid-stance, so while the foot is um, directly underneath your body taking a look at how far forward the body is leaning. And this, again, is um, the relationship between the shoulder joint to the center of mass, so the center of your body. An anterior lean, as seen in picture A, tends to promote forward propulsion and drive, which, again, improves your efficiency of running so you don't have to expend as much energy for your run. A forward trunk lean is also associated with reduction in stress at the knee, um, and also does not place any more increased demand at the ankle. So when you see somebody that tends to run a little bit more upright, like picture A, you might want to, um, to be cueing them to lead with their hips or their ankle in order to um, promote that forward propulsion, but not initiating just pure trunk flexion. All right, so overstriding is, a, is another biomechanical analysis that we look at. So overstriding is, um, is defined as having the foot a little bit too far forward at initial contact. So in picture B, you will see um, there is a dot that is positioned at, um, a pink dot at the hip of that runner, 
and then a vertical line drawn from where her heel strikes. And you can see how far forward that line is in relationship to her hip joint. Picture B then tends to have her stride occurring more um, centered below her body, so that vertical line from her heel to her hip joint is a little bit closer. Overstriding um, has been associated with increased risk of tibial stress fractures, and that um, can come from that same idea as too great a force is being transmitted from the ground up through the body instead of the opposite way around. All right, bear with me. We're almost done with the biomechanical analysis. Um, so this next one is looking at your vertical displacement, but in you know, common terms, it's really how, how much does your head bounce up and down while you're running. So you don't want to see a large vertical displacement during stance phase because this is associated with um, some increased forces being transmitted with your knee during terminal knee extension or when your knee is at its most straightened position. It also is demonstrating that there is the increased ground reaction force again occurring, so that means the forces that are being transmitted from the ground up through your body is greater than the force that you are putting then through the ground. And then also an increased braking impulse. So you're having that kind of really, really sharp acceleration and deceleration occurring throughout the running cycle, which decreases your efficiency and again makes you work harder while you're running. Um, like I said, with vertical displacement, as it increases, these are the runners that um, tend to appear like they're bounding as they run. So you're going to see, um, like in picture A, they have a greater vertical displacement where the line at heel strike versus um, mid stance is a lot higher. So there's a greater distance being traveled by the pelvis um, up and down, where picture B, that distance um, remains a little bit more relatively steady and constant. It's not as, as great of an up and down movement. Okay, this picture um, is then one of the, the views that we would, one of the things we would be concerned at with a posterior view or looking at somebody from either in front or behind as they're running. So a pelvic drop is something that we look for because if you do not have a stable pelvis while you're running, you tend to get collapsing of the joints both above and below. So if the, stable isn't pelvi or if the pelvis isn't stable, you tend to see some shifting going on within the low back, which increases the demand on your low back muscles and your spine. Um, but then again, if the pelvis isn't stable, um, both the knee and the ankle can then collapse as a result throughout your stance phase of running. So pelvic drop, it is assessed by compar comparing the pelvic height of both your stance and your swing leg. So an excessive pelvic drop, as you can see by um, picture B, her swing leg, that dot that is indicating the back part of her pelvis, so that, that bony area that's in the back of your hips, that side is lower on her swing phase than it is on her stance phase. So that's saying that her the leg that is um, the one supporting her body, her stance leg, is not strong enough, the hip muscles are not strong enough to support her pelvis and keep it level. All right, and then the last picture that we um, I'll be addressing with the biomechanics is your knee angle while you're running. So this is occurring, this picture, um, picture, both, both A and B are pictures that are occurring at mid stance. So we're looking at how close together are her knees. So the picture, first picture A, you can see that there is some distance between, between her knees as she is in mid stance on one side and swing phase on the other. Um, also can see that her pelvis is remaining relatively stable. Now in picture B, this, this image shows a little bit more of the knee in position of running, which, as I previously mentioned, can be caused from the pelvis from having a weak hip, hip muscle that is unable to support your pelvis, and then as a result, you get collapsing of your knee inward. All right, so now we're gonna be moving on to one of the next factors that can lead to, to running injuries. So, with our musculoskeletal system, this is your muscles, your joints, and your ligaments. It's all the things that help to support your body and allow you to do everything you need to do, um, both either throughout your daily activities or um, any sort of additional demand you place on it with your recreational activities. So with musculoskeletal, it's a, it's a combination of three different systems or three different components. You need to have adequate mobility of your joints and tissues to be able to move your body through the ne necessary range of motion. Um, and most specifically, the necessary range of motion for the gait cycle of running. 
stability, you need to be able to have strong enough muscles to keep your body in proper postural and anatomical alignment throughout that gait cycle. And then lastly, you need to have um, the power sufficient enough to generate forward propulsion in order to minimize your energy expenditure and maximize efficiency. So anytime you happen to be lacking in one of these areas, chances are you are expending additional energy to complete movements and placing additional stress on areas that are not designed to withstand such stress. So with mobility, throughout the running cycle, one of the most important um, places that you need proper mobility is the motion to get hip extension or to get the leg behind you. This involves needing adequate tissue length for full hip extension, so that bringing that leg all the way back, ankle dorsiflexion, and then big toe extension. So we haven't talked too much about hips or ankles yet, um, but in order to have adequate push-off phase, which is what drives your forward momentum, you need to have the adequate range of motion at both your ankle and your big toe. So some of the ways that you can, can work on these areas that are typically um, can be of concern with runners is with different stretches or foam rolling techniques. So I'm going to go through just a few of them that um, I suggest, but knowing that each person comes with their own individual body discrepancies and this is just a general guidelines. If you are having injuries, as always, I would recommend um, seeing some sort of a medical professional. But these are just some good ones to, to either aid in injury prevention or can help if you are starting to notice any, any areas of concern. So one of the first ways to work on getting that hip extension that we talked about is to improve the mobility and the range of motion of your hip flexors. So hip flexors, very important. If they are tight, they limit the leg from swinging like a pendulum throughout the hip cycle. And this can cause um, further problems and increased stress throughout your lower body. Essentially, it doesn't allow your body to, um, to go through the gait cycle like it needs to, and then that can cause problems throughout the rest of the, rest of the cycle. So a kneeling hip flexor stretch is a, is a pretty good way to counteract those tight hip flexors that come as a result of prolonged sitting. What you want to do is you want to kneel onto the leg or the hip that you are um, desiring to stretch, and ideally I would do this on both legs, but if you find that one is tighter than the other, you can always focus a little more emphasis on that side. But you just want to simply get into a comfortable kneeling position with the leg on the bottom being the hip you are attempting to stretch. And then instead of doing any sort of a forward leaning, you want to think about tucking your pelvis or rotating your hips backwards. This is going to stretch that front area of the hip and also down along through the knee by having the knee into the bent position. You want to find an area where you can um, have a nice comfortable stretch and then just work on maintaining that position for a prolonged period of time. Um, it, it's ideally you want to work on mobility after tissues have been warmed up, but I also find you know, if people are having trouble working flexibility and mobility exercises into their um, exercise routine, it's something that you can do while you are maybe watching the news for the evening or checking up on social media on your phone. Just get down into a kneeling position, tuck your pelvis, find a good stretch, and just hang out there for a little bit. Another area of concern is um, the foot, so the plantar fascia. So I'm sure most of you have either dealt with yourself some plantar fasciitis or know somebody who has. Um, but your plantar fascia, it is the band of tissue that is at the bottom of your foot. And what most people don't realize is it actually extends all the way from your, your big toe, and then it attaches to the muscles on the back of your calf. So it's a pretty long tissue area of tissue that needs to be stretched out, and it's very important for having, again, that adequate ankle motion and then big toe motion. Um, it needs to have proper mobility in order to guide your foot throughout the gait cycle. Mobility problems at both the foot and the ankle, they can cause problems up the chain at both the hip, the knee, and the low back. So a good way to work, work the plantar fascia, um, either just in injury prevention or if you are feeling that you're having any sort of pain or tenderness or stiffness within the, the foot or the ankle, is to do some self-massage. So you can either position yourself in a way that you're able to use your hands to massage the bottom of your foot, or you probably have heard of um, other methods where you can put a tennis ball on the ground, uh, freeze a water bottle, whatever it may be. But you just want to provide a little bit of, of massage and mobility within those tissues 
ideally every day if you're having problems, but if you are doing it more as kind of an injury prevention, whenever you're able to work it into your routine. But doing it for about three, or three to five minutes is usually sufficient. Um, aiming more towards that three to five time if you are having an injury and not having to do it quite as long if it's more for prevention. While you are doing the self-massage of your foot, you do want to focus more on areas that are a little bit more tender. So you can maybe just either hold pressure over that area. If you're using a tennis ball or a, a racquetball, just maybe oscillate a little bit side to side, forward and backwards, and just try to get that area moving a little bit more because tight tissues will not stretch out as you're running, which then you know, limits your motion and limits the power that you're able to produce. Um, some other ways that you can address mobility but are not included within these slides include foam rolling. So foam rolling is a wonderful way to massage large parts of your body. So you can focus more on the front of your thigh, the side of your thigh, getting your IT band, the hamstrings. Um, if you go onto, onto the Internet, you can find all sorts of resources on, on getting you know, different positions depending on what area you are trying to address. Uh, the big thing is just to to do it either, you know, hopefully ideally when tissues are nice and warm, so after you've done your exercise for the day. And then just focusing again on those tender areas of the body um, for about 30 to 90 seconds. All right, so the next component within um, injury prevention is having adequate stability of your body within the musculoskeletal system. So here we are revisiting the previously mentioned lateral pelvic tilt that can occur during the stance phase of running. So as you can see in um, picture A, that has a nice stable pelvis. So those side hip muscles, your hip abductors, they're able to um, generate enough force to keep that hip steady while that opposite side is in swing phase. Picture B, however, is what causes that lateral pelvic tilt. So that muscle on the side, it um, for whatever reason, is not contracting properly to maintain um, a stable pelvis. This is important because running is just a series of single leg impacts and your single leg stance or single leg support phase account for um, over 60% of your gait cycle. And then keeping in mind that while we're running, you're having forces exerted throughout your muscles, your tissues, your joints, and your ligaments that are three to five times your body weight. So there's some large amount of force happening. And if this force is occurring in um, a not anatomically correct position, that's where you can get injury. All right, so one of the first exercises that um, I suggest for working on some stability is your donkey kick. So this is completed while you are on all fours. This is a great exercise because not only are we working on strengthening hip extension, which is found to be weak in a lot of people, but we're also addressing a little bit of spinal stability. So you need to be able to have a nice and stable low back and then have your, um, your glutes or your hip extensor muscles contracting in order to get that push off or that drive forward during running. So the important thing with this exercise is to make sure that you are able to keep your back relatively straight. And you can, you can do this either monitoring yourself with, um, with a floor length mirror or by placing a broomstick or a cane across your pelvis. So you don't want to see your low back either arching excessively or your pelvis tip tipping while you're completing this movement. Um, the movement then is having your knee bent at a 90 degree angle and punching your foot and your thigh up towards the ceiling. Um, a big, big thing that you can see with this is people tend to kick too high and they end up arching their back. So then they're training their body to use their back extensors instead of their hip extensors. And that's not what you want to see. This is meant to be, um, like it says up there, isolating your glutes from your low back. So you're able to let the glutes do the work that they need to be doing and the low back muscles maintaining a, a stable spine. Um, a good starting point is, you know, just trying to do as many as you're able to, but keeping correct form. So I don't like to have people go ahead and work up to that 50 reps just because it says that on the slide while all 50 of those reps, their back is arching. So you're pretty much just retraining on an improper movement pattern and setting yourself up for injury. So a goal is to get up to, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 reps per leg, but you want those repetitions to be with good form. So if your starting point is maybe it's hard for you to do about 10 of them, keeping the good form, that's where you start because everyone has their own, you know, individual strengths and weaknesses, and we want to make sure that you are training your body to, 
complete these movements in proper, proper technique. All right, another good exercise uh, to isolate the glutes and also work on your spinal extensors is a stability ball bridge. So you're going to position yourself with your calves on a, on a Swiss ball. Uh, the larger the ball is, the more difficult it's going to be. You want to um, squeeze your buttocks or your gluteal muscles and then drive your hips up towards the ceiling, essentially creating a bridge from your ankles, hips, and shoulders. You can either work on some up-down motion or you can work on a little bit more of the endurance factor and work to hold this up to 60 seconds. As, um, as has been mentioned, there is majority of the time throughout running is spent in single leg stance. So working on some single leg balance is very, very important. A good starting point is to just simply get used to standing upright on, your, on one leg. So you want to be able to do it anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds without losing your balance. And while you're working on this, a good, a good cue from your foot is to, um, to do it without your shoes on to get improve the sensory input from the bottom of your foot. And also work on making sure that you're keeping big toe, your big toe in contact with the ground throughout this. Uh, the big toe is, is one of the main stabilizers of your body and it also um, promotes the appropriate muscles to contract to maintain your balance. So a good starting point is just simply to stand upright on one leg, and then as you have mastered this, um, you're able to do it for 20 to 30 seconds. You can then further your challenge yourself by transitioning into more of a single leg squat position, um, mimicking the form that we tend to be in during stance phase of running. Clamshells are an exercise that are aimed to stabilize the side hip muscles, your, your hip abductors, um, most specifically the glute med, gluteus medius. And this is what can help um, improve the lateral stability of your pelvis, which is preventing that lateral pelvic drop, like we've seen in a couple of the previous slides. In order to do this, you're going to want to lie on your side with your hips, knees, and feet all stacked together. Maintaining a, a steady back, a steady and stable back, you're then going to lift your knee, your top knee, up towards the ceiling while keeping your hips and your feet stacked. If this um, is easy to do without any sort of resistance, you can go ahead and add a little bit of resistance band just above the knee. But again, focusing on keeping a nice neutral spine. This is, this is where you can kind of pour in a, pull in a little bit more of your core strength, where you are going to keep the back steady while you are asking the hip muscles to contract. You want to work up to a high number of repetitions with this exercise also. I'm doing about 30, 30 or more before you go to add a resistance band. And then as you get um, pretty well established with your clamshell strength lean on your side, it's good then to transition it into more of, of a standing position because that is essentially where you want your clam or your hip abductors to be most active when you're in that, that stance and that swing phase. So a good way to do this is to do a wall press where you are um, going to be standing, having the leg that is up next to the wall bent at a 90 degree angle, your knee and then have either a towel or a yoga block or a small ball positioned next to the wall so you're able to push in towards that ball with your knee. Um, this challenges not only the hip abductors on the side that you are pushing in, but it is also a, a good balance exercise for that stance leg on the, on the left-hand side in this picture. Uh, a good goal is to work up to holding it for 20 to 30 seconds, and you're trying to do a couple of repetitions on each leg. All right, the next component within um, the musculoskeletal system that you need in order to, to be able to run is to have adequate power. Um, and power, most specifically, you need it to occur during the push-off phase of, of running. So that's where you hope to get more of that forward propulsion and not that upward momentum. Um, you also need to have power to be able to absorb the, the forces that are being transmitted throughout the acceleration and the deceleration that occurs with running. And the majority of the power it is coming from our foot and our ankle as well as our hips. So looking at a couple of exercises that um, you can do to, to increase your strength and increase your power, uh, some of the most important ones are heel raises to get the strong ankle plantar flexors and ankle muscles. With heel raises, if you haven't been practicing them, you do want to start more um, with double legs, so doing heel raises on both legs at the same time before you then try to do a single leg heel raise, which is um, similar to what is in that picture. So he is 
he or she is only doing heel raise on one leg. That will be more challenging with, than with double leg because you are you know, lifting up your whole body against gravity through only one leg. So if you haven't been working on your ankle strength at all, I would definitely recommend starting with more of a double leg and seeing how you tolerate it um, at that three sets of 15 recommendation below. Uh, once you've become um, pretty, pretty strong with the single leg heel raises, you can then try to transition into more of an eccentric ankle, ankle contraction. Um, so an eccentric muscle contraction is when we are asking a muscle to, um, to deliver force or power while we're also per putting it on stretch. So the muscle is lengthening while it's active. This is much more difficult than um, shortening in active muscles. So it, the way that you can work on your calf and your ankle strength eccentrically is by then doing the heel raises off of a step. So by having your heel lower than that step, the muscle is on increased stretch. So by going um, up onto your toes and then lowering back down so your heel is lower than the step height, you are getting that eccentric contraction. Plyometrics is, um, is another way that you can work to increase the power that you're able to, to produce while you're running. Jumping exercises, they can work to increase the elasticity of your muscles, um, and they also work to provide um, absorption of force and then also work to help you to quick, quickly transition into force production. So with running, again, there's that acceleration and deceleration. So you need to be able to absorb those forces, but then you want to be able to then transmit forces, and you want to be able to do that quickly in order to run faster and more efficiently. Um, in, included on this slide are just kind of some ideas of plyometrics. You can do some standing jumps, some lateral jumps. Um, I would start with them on the ground and then working up to more of the box jumps that like are pictured on the slide. But um, if you haven't been working on any sort of regular strength training exercises, you would want to, to get involved into some sort of a strength training program for you know at least eight weeks before you would initiate some sort of a plyometric program just to make sure that you have the sufficient strength base before you go and ask to um, further place demands on those muscles to generate large amounts of force over a small period of time. All right, now we have reached the final component that can lead to injuries, so some errors in your training. Um, unfortunately, this cartoon does a fairly accurate depiction of the mindset of a lot of runners, especially when you happen to be feeling the pressure of um, an anticipated race or an event you have signed up for. However, your know, body is its own natural warning system, and it's not wise to, to ignore any sort of warnings that it's providing you as far as pain or, or soreness. So, so don't be like the person in this picture. You know, if you have an injury, you need to give your body adequate time to rest. So components of a good training program um, include a warm-up and then safe progression of, of running, either with um, increasing your speed or increasing your distance, allowing for proper recovery, including cross-training into your routine, um, adding some of the strength in the core exercises like was previously mentioned, and then also your equipment. For a warm-up, um, it's wise to just do you know, a couple minutes of a brisk walk or a short jog just to increase the blood flow and improve um, your tissue's flexibility and ability to stretch. Another good part of a warm-up, if you have time for, is it more of a dynamic warm-up. So a dynamic warm-up um, consists of taking your body through uh, just kind of various degrees of motion and force production. So you can just map out a nice short area and just go back and forth doing some high knees where you're marching your knees up towards the ceiling, some butt kicks where you're trying to you know, kick your behind with your foot. Open the gate includes some, some opening up your, your hips, so getting some internal and external rotation. Heel and toe walking is a good way to warm up those ankle and foot muscles. Um, some lunges with trunk rotation, again, works on stability with, with a little bit of the trunk rotation that occurs during the gait cycle. And then the skipping, karaoke, and bound and hold, those are just kind of more of running specific drills. Um, as far as, as progressing your overall training, you do want to start, if you have not been involved in any sort of a running program, to, to initially begin with some sort of a walk and jog program. So do, you know, maybe one to two minutes of, of walking or even more than that, and then 
progressing to kind of a light jog. So you don't want to just immediately jump into trying to go for a 20-minute run because that's asking your body to do to do a lot more than it has been been able to do before, and you're going to fatigue out those muscles and set yourself up for injury. So starting with um, kind of a low low number of low distance, low time, and including in those periods of jogging and walking to give the, your muscles a chance to recover. Um, there is also, you know, a bit of a 10% rule that they say when you are progressing your running program. So you don't want to increase throughout a one-week period the distance or the time you're running by anything greater than 10%. That just, you know, naturally gives your body a chance to adapt to the increased stress and demand you're placing on it. Um, and then on the Internet, you can also find various couch to 5K or couch to 10K programs, which have it pretty well laid out, and they also are pretty good about including in the rest days that you need um, any sort of cross-training days, and just progressing your mileage and your distance safely. Uh, for the recovery aspect after a run, you, it is good because those tissues have been warmed up to then do your stretching either statically or dynamically, and just making sure that you're not letting those muscles, you know, as they cool down, tighten up. Um, you can also include in some foam rolling, um, refueling, with, which means, you know, having adequate calories, protein, and carbohydrates in order to to provide your body with the nutrients and the energy needed needed um, during your run. Um, RICE, RICE is something that I'm sure most of you have heard of, but it stands for rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So say you do feel a little bit of soreness or increased pain, especially localized to one area of your body following a run, you want to immediately just get on, get on the defensive there. You want to, to rest that area. You want to provide um, some ice to help control the inflammation. If it's an area that you're able to wrap, um, you can add some compression to reduce any sort of swelling. And then if it is, you know, in the lower part of your body and it is very swollen, elevation will help to assist with um, the fluid reduction and, and overall decreasing the pain. But then the most important part is to listen to your body. So although you um, may be dedicated to some sort of a running program, if, if your program tells you that you need to be running five miles that day but you go to start off and it's really not feeling like it's going to handle those five miles, you want to just listen to your body and, you know, maybe cut it back to only three that day. So your body, like I said, it's, it's, it's pretty good at letting us know when we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing, and it's, it's only in your best interest to then further listen to it. And I apologize, I am going over time, so hopefully most of you are able to stick around. Okay, cross-training and rest days. So kind of already talked about rest days, making sure that you're listening to your body. Cross-training, should you have some sort of an injury, you can then increase your, your cross-training days. So it's good to have them built into your running program in general. But if you do have some sort of an injury, um, don't feel like that means that you have to just be, you know, vanquished to the couch and not doing anything. There are plenty of low-impact ways that you can, can maintain your cardiovascular fitness and uh, overall, you know, activity levels. Um, some of them that are more well-tolerated are biking, walking, and swimming. So... Swimming, usually, usually pretty well tolerated. You can even do some kind of underwater running to, to keep up the same motions and movements. All right, so equipment. Luckily with running, you know, it's a pretty inexpensive sport, um, I guess depending on how you do it with your running clothes, but all you essentially need are clothes that are comfortable to move in and then shoes that are comfortable to wear. So... Running um, with running shoes, there has been a whole lot of talk of, you know, placing people into these specific categories dependent upon their anatomical structure of their feet. Um, so I'm sure you all have heard these terms and have seen charts similar to this. The problem with this is that running involves such complex movement and forces that what happens with your foot during um, your static standing position, it might not correlate exactly to what's happening with your foot as you're transitioning through the running cycle. So what um, you kind of see that research is, is kind of leaning more towards is just finding shoes that are comfortable towards you. Um, I would recommend if you have the time and the ability to just visit a running specific shoe store, especially if you are finding that you are plagued with, with injuries or more prone to injuries. Um, a running specific shoe store is, they're pretty good about, you know, providing you with recommendations based on what you're telling them. Um, they typically have treadmills where you can even try out running with those shoes on before purchasing them. And then they typically do have a very relaxed return policy. So you're able to, to break them in at home, try them out on a treadmill for a little bit, and you can bring them back in, you know, even sometimes up to 90 days later and say, you know what, I, I kept trying these shoes out and 
I was still using my regular shoes for running, and these ones I just don't feel like they're going to work, and they will you know, be happy to provide you with in-store credit or, or transition. Um, errors that can happen with footwear, though, um, are not having supportive enough shoes. So you do want to have shoes that have support, especially if you're going to be going into more of the high mileage throughout the week. Um, another big error is not changing your shoes quickly enough. So, you know, shoes, you can look at them kind of like tires on a car. If you go past that recommended amount, you're, you're just kind of setting yourself up for problems later. So you want to recommend um, replacing the shoes, you know, at 400 to 500 miles. But you know, once they start like feeling like they're not supportive enough, I would even start to, to look at new shoes sooner. Um, and then the drastic change in footwear. So going from a very, very supportive shoe to say um, a barefoot minimalist shoe. That would, doing that is too dramatic of a change and your body will not be able to, um, to accommodate for that without injury typically. Okay, and I am so sorry that I am running late. Um, <laughs> But so just going through, I thought a good topic to address because with running, especially after you're starting a running program, it is typical to have a little bit of, of soreness because you're asking your body to do something that it hasn't done before. Um, the problem then gets to be when that muscle soreness then transfers into more of the pain or more of a chronic issue. So just wanted to hit a little bit on the difference between soreness and pain. So muscle soreness, these are those tender muscles, and they um, tend to occur either during exercise or you can find the onset being anywhere from two to three days after that activity. They typically are short-lived. Um, typically, you'll find that you, you might find that area really, really stiffens up after with prolonged positioning, and then it'll feel better when you're able to, to maybe go for a brisk walk or stretch it out. But this is just kind of your typical, you know, your body's letting you know that, hey, you put a little bit more demand on me than that I'm used to having, and I, I just need a little bit of time to recover, and I'm going to be stronger afterwards. So that muscle soreness, as depicted here on the slide, that's something I wouldn't be too concerned about, you know, but definitely listen to your body. It's when you get more into kind of the achy and sharp pain, um, pain that occurs at rest and during exercise, and pain that, are, that tends to persist after periods of rest, um, and then that rest, ice, compression, and elevation. That is when uh, you want to be, you know, Spend a little bit more time, be a little bit more concerned with it, but, you know, you want to rest that area and not push through the pain. That's probably the, the big thing is listening to your body and not pushing through a run when you have the onset of pain that continues to get worse as your run increases. Um, so I kind of talked about that a little bit, when to seek medical attention. Uh, any worsening or extreme pain or pain that lasts consistently um, with you know, that one to two week period where you have been doing, the, taking the necessary precautions to, to, um, to alleviate the pain and the inflammation. Okay, so if you do find that you have a, an injury, just kind of wanted to give a little bit of promotion to, um, to physical therapists because especially if it's a running injury, in most clinics you will find somebody that would be more than happy to, to work with you, work with runners and, and give you that biomechanical analysis. Um, depending upon the clinic, physical therapists, we you know, do need a physician referral. We typically, we would complete an initial evaluation, so find out a little bit more about your running history, um, what sort of things caused the pain, when did you first start to notice the pain, how long you've been running, and so on. Uh, we'll then later set you up with that biomechanical analysis on the treadmill where we can analyze your running fo form, um, give you some exercises to work on at home, at home based off of that analysis, and then have the follow-up appointments to, to kind of see how things are progressing. It is also good to know that with physical therapy, say you're coming in with a, a running injury, we will um, give you, you know, our recommendations, but then we will re um, refer you on appropriately if we do find that it is you know, something based off of our clinical judgment that requires more medical attention or imaging. Okay, so some of the running form tips that I have for you. So cadence, that is defined as the number of steps per minute. Um, a good guideline is finding, is, is about um, 160 to 180 steps per minute. The way that you can um, count this out yourself is to simply count one foot step over a period, over a one minute period, and then double it. Um, if you do have some sort of an injury, I would first start with increasing that cadence, so you, but you don't want to increase it for any more than 5 to 10% at a time. So calculate it out and don't try to increase it too drastically. Another good running form tip is to maintain good posture, so you want to have that um, upright torso, head over your shoulders, 
and then make sure that you're monitoring it throughout your run because as you go through the mileage, you, your muscles can fatigue, so you want to make sure that you're not letting yourself get into more of a slouched position as your run progresses. And then also practicing that good posture throughout your day to build up the, your postural strength. Um, a tip to land lightly. So you want to be a little bit more conscious with um, how loud of landing you have with your foot strike. So when you aim to run quiet, uh, we tend to make some more natural adjustments, like shortening our stride, landing more on that midfoot, um, which then can lessen the impact of the forces being transmitted throughout your joints. Um, leaning forward. So that the forward lean or leading with your hips, that again helps to kind of work on that forward propulsion so you are you know, running more efficiently. One of the last clues that I like to tell people is to feel your glutes. So you, your glutes are the main muscle that helps to drive the push off and the hip extension. So a lot of times what happens is people simply, they are not um, isolating their glutes or they're not recruiting their glutes appropriately during that push off phase. So they're using other muscles like their hamstrings or their low back. So you want to either you know subconsciously think about squeezing your glutes during that push off or you can even kind of give a little bit of a tap or a tactile cue to those muscles to just see if you can get them to contract a little bit more. All right, so sorry I had to rush through that last part, but I wanted to make sure that we could get through all the slides. Um, I guess that this is going to be opening up for the, the question format. And it looks like we have one. Okay, so the question is, for the shoe support, um, this person has been removing the insert that comes with the shoe and replacing it with a super feet insert that has been prescribed for my plantar fasciitis. Does this make sense to you? Um, yes, that absolutely makes sense. So especially if you're dealing with a little bit more of plantar fasciitis, taking a little bit of the stress off of the plantar fascia and providing a little bit more arch support can be beneficial. So um, the super feet, that's a great insert. It, it does have a nice kind of heel cup and heel support, and it provides you with just a little bit more of that arch support for for taking the pressure off your plantar fascia. So that, absolutely, that sounds like somebody, whoever suggested that to you was, was very, very knowledgeable in the recommendation and it's a good thing for you to work on. Um, and then I would just also, you know, address the plantar fascia itself by doing the rolling if you haven't been doing that in the stretches. Um, any other questions? And again, I apologize for going almost into the 1 p.m. time. Nope. All right. Well, I'm going to pass it back over to Donna in case she had any announcements. Thank you again for uh, joining us today, and I will send out the link to the recording later this week. And have a good day. We're going to end the webinar now. Thank you.